We are beginning a study in the book of Revelation. I'm really excited that Jeremy has given me the opportunity to share with this first chapter from Revelation with you today. It's always a, a privilege for me to share the Bible with our congregation. And it's especially exciting to look into the first chapter of Revelation. I want to begin by asking you a question today, because when we talk about Revelation, one word always seems to pop into people's minds, and that word is apocalypse. Apocalypse. Now, what comes to mind when you hear the word apoc apocalypse? War? Death? The end? Somebody tell me what the word apocalypse means. Unveiling. Unveiling. Revelation is what it means. Revelation, the unveiling of something. I saw a headline this week about a new book that's coming out, written about the book of Revelation. Here's what it said. Tsunamis, earthquakes, world wars, <clears throat> nuclear disasters, and upheaval in the Middle East. Could it be we are living in the final trumpet days of Revelation? And that's what often comes into our minds when we talk about the apocalypse. The apocalypse, end time events, the mark of the beast, the antichrist. That's what we often think about. But interesting that the word apocalypse simply means revelation. And in this case, the revelation of Jesus Christ. So as we get into Revelation, what we want to do is hear what the Bible has to say to us. Forget wars, rumors of wars, Antichrist, Mark of the Beast. Just take all that out of your mind for a while and listen to what the Word of God has to say to you. And keep in mind that when we read in Revelation, Revelation is not just about the future, not just about the end of time, but it is about, and if you look at Revelation 1.19, it says it is about the things which you have seen, that's the past, and what is now, that's the present, and things which shall take place after these things. And of course, that would be the future. And so John is instructed to write about the past, the present, and the future. Now, one more thing before we begin, begin looking at the text here. And that is, much of what is written in Revelation is written in code. How many knew that? It's written in code. Most people don't know that Revelation is written in code. The New American Standard Bible uses the word communication. And the NIV uses the word testifies, but the literal meaning of the word translated communication or testifies is to signify. And that means what's written in the book of Revelation is actually coded. It's coded because much of what is written there is indescribable. There aren't words to describe what's going on. It's coded because much of what is written is beyond what we could even describe or express. And it was also coded to hide the meaning from some people because what is written there is not intended for everyone. Now, fortunately, there is a key to the code. And for example, when we get on our computers and you have to sign in to a website, many of us have a code that we use. That code might be your date of birth, might be some form of your name, might, you might put some symbols in there with it for the code, but you use a code to sign into the computer. Now, fortunately, there is a key to the code. And the key to the code is the Old Testament. 
That's pretty amazing, isn't it? The key to the code is the Old Testament. We don't have to look for someone's secret date of birth, some secret breakdown on a code or something. The code is already written and it's found in the Old Testament. And we hear people preaching all the time and not using the code to Revelation. Commentator William Barclay says, Revelation is difficult. It is involved and is often unintelligible. And so there's many opinions on what the coded message actually means and many interpretations of what's taught in the Bible. You know, if you look at Revelation and some people take what's called a historical approach to Revelation. That is, they look back into the Old Testament, look for the code found there, and apply it to what's in the book of Revelation. Some people like to look at the book itself and try to interpret what's there, and they're kind of futuristic in how they're looking, but often that doesn't make sense. And I think many times if we, if we watch preachers on television, it gets so complex that you can't even figure out what they're talking about. And often really what they're talking about is let's figure out a way to make more money. But often interpretations of revelation are twisted and distorted to fit the preacher's doctrinal message and really not to interpret what's actually there. So with that in mind, let's take a look at the book of Revelation chapter one. If you wanna follow along in your pew Bibles, we'll be in Revelation one, one through three right now. Revelation one, one. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it because the time is near. Now, as we read that over, did you catch what that says? Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy. Now we can all read that prophecy, right? How many hear it? Because the next thing he says is blessed are those who hear it. And some of us read, sometimes we hear what it says, but the third thing is to take it to heart. And he says, this is written because the time is near. Read, hear, take to heart, because the time is near. Did you ever meet someone and you met with them for just a few seconds and you walked away and you said, you know what, I don't like that guy. I don't like him. Well, why don't you like him? I don't know, I just don't like that guy. Or you meet someone else and you meet him just a few seconds and you walk away. Boy, I really liked him. I really liked her, They're, that person's great. Studies show that we form an opinion of someone within about 10 seconds of meeting them. That means we can often misjudge a person almost immediately when we meet them. But not only do we misjudge them, we also tend to stereotype them based on their appearance, maybe how they dress, how they talk, uh, whether they look you in the eye when they talk to you, how they're built, and so on. But within 10 seconds, we form an opinion of someone who we just meet. A few years ago, I attended an uh, insurance seminar in Columbus, Ohio. And I got there around noontime, and I had a mission when I went there. I wanted to talk to one of the higher-up executives at this one insurance company. So I walked in, and I got there at lunchtime. I walk in, there's nowhere to sit. So I look around and I see this dumpy looking guy sitting at a table and I thought, well, I'll go sit down with him. He's got these big thick Coke bottle glasses on, his hair's all messed up. Uh, actually, he's shorter than me, which 
you know, that makes him dumpy looking. <laughs> but here's the thing, within a few seconds, I formed an opinion on who this guy was. And I tried to talk to him over lunch, it was really hard to talk to, and in fact, it just got to the point where it's plain old awkward. So I ate, got up, walked away. About a half hour later, we assembled for the seminar, and as the main speaker was introduced as the president of the insurance company, that I was trying to find an executive to talk to. Guess who it was? That's right, little dumpy from lunch. Uh, but I stereotyped him so fast that I decided this guy was not important and I'm just gonna move on. Stereotype, quick opinion, and wrong. Now, how many of you have met Jesus? None of you? <laughs> None of you have met Jesus. All right, opportunity to evangelize today. No Christians. What does Jesus look like? What does Jesus look like? Is that him? Jewish? Is that Jesus? No? We don't know. We don't know. But what comes to mind when we think about Jesus, this is it. Walter Salman painted this portrait of Jesus in 1940. And this portrait has been reproduced over a half a billion times. That's billion with a B. And I think for many of us, this is the stereotypical image that we have of Jesus and that we've had our whole lives. And when we think of Jesus, we think about this. We might think of that picture of him with a lamb on his shoulders or maybe a picture of him sitting around with some little kids, talking to the kids. Uh, but basically, the picture that we have of Jesus is this, long hair, beard, wearing some sort of robe, sandals on his feet, speaking in a soft voice to people, kind-hearted to everyone, and giving to everyone that he can. This is our idea of Jesus. And he almost comes over as a pushover type person. But what if we saw Jesus in a different light? What if the world really knew who Jesus was? What he looks like? The amount of power that Jesus really has? What if we saw Jesus as a, a powerful man, a big man, deep voice, forceful voice? What if we pictured Jesus pick, tipping over the tables in the temple? What if we saw him as creator of the universe? Or the victorious warrior returning one final time to conquer sin and to crush Satan for all of eternity? What if our vision of Jesus was more like an action hero, steel-fisted, intimidating, and nobody messes with Jesus? That's not our view of him, is it? That's not our view of Jesus. And it's not the world's view of Jesus. Not only does the world view Jesus that way, but much of that carries over into the world view of the church. So as we look at Revelation 1 today, we're going to see a different and powerful image of Jesus. Far different from that stereotypical image that we normally have. And in Revelation 1, what we find a, a, is a portrait of Jesus that's far different from the one that's up here on the screen. And it's time for the church and our world to see really who Jesus is and how powerful and mighty Jesus really is. Now, let's move on to Revelation 1, 12 through 16. It says, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. 
And when I turned around, I saw seven gold lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. Wow, that's a far different picture than the one that was just up there about Jesus. That's a picture of Jesus I don't know that anyone has ever seen. No lamb over the shoulder, no long dark brown flowing hair. No picture of this Jesus that we often have in our minds of this soft spoken, easy going Jesus. So let's look at this image. Let's look at these verses and see if the image portrayed there comes close at all to how you picture Jesus. Let's start with the Son of Man. What's the code to Revelation? Old Testament. The Apostle John is echoing the words we find in Daniel 7, 13 and 14, where we read about the second person of the Trinity and all his authority. Remember again, Revelation written in code, and the key is the Old Testament. Jesus is not simply a, a teacher who hung out with the fishermen and tax collectors and little children. Jesus is equal to the Ancient of Days. And I'd even go so far as to say Jesus is the Ancient of Days found in Daniel. Jesus is God. We find here Jesus is the Ancient of Days mentioned in Daniel. Daniel 7, 9. And the Ancient of Days took his seat. His vesture was like white snow, and the hair of his head was pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames. Look what Daniel saw in the vision of Jesus. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshiped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. That's amazing. It's amazing, and even more amazing is that the one who has the authority and glory and sovereignty, the one to whom every human being will someday bow, the one whose kingdom will never be destroyed, calls you and me friend. That's amazing, isn't it? Jesus is all powerful, yet if we know him, he's our friend. Okay, look at his clothing. What kind of clothing do we find Jesus wearing in Revelation? Not in the photo or the, the uh, pictures of him, but what kind of clothing do we find him wearing here in Revelation? John saw a man wearing a robe reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. What kind of outfit is this? What kind of clothing is he wearing? Royalty, this is the clothing of a king. Jesus has tossed aside his earthly rags in Revelation to reveal his, his true identity. Almighty, sovereign of the universe, king of the universe, ruler of all. And this again is almost identical to the wording that we find over in Daniel. In Daniel it says, I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, there was a certain man dressed in linen, whose waist was girded with a belt 
of pure gold. Revelation, Daniel, almost identical. Not only is Jesus' outfit not what we might imagine, but look at his hair. Instead of that long flowing brown hair in the picture, we read in Revelation that Jesus' hair is white like wool, as white as snow. And in the Bible, white hair represents old age and wisdom. So I'm glad I have what little I have left is white. We know it's old age, but it's also wisdom. And the point here is, that is that Jesus is far different from how we normally picture him. Here's a verse from Proverbs 16.31 to use when somebody wants to make fun of your gray hair. Gray hair is a crown of splendor. It is attained by a righteous life. So you can use that someday if you need to. But back to Revelation and Daniel, Jesus' gray hair is a symbol of his deity and his dignity. Now look at his eyes. His eyes are blazing fire. And again, back to Daniel. Daniel 10.6. His body was like burl. His face had the appearance of lightning. His eyes were like flaming torches. Ever seen that look before? Boy, my mom used to give me that look all the time. And I get it from Debbie every now and then too. <laughs> you get that look, you know what it means. Because it could burn a hole right through you. It's the blazing fire from Jesus' eyes that pierced through our hypocrisies. It's the blazing fire of those eyes that looks inward to see the real person that's there, our inner self. Jesus' eyes reveal who we really are. You know, we can go around here and put on the biggest front ever, and we could fool our friends and our coworkers and our neighbors, and we can even sometimes fool our, our fellow church members and to think that we're the best we're the best at following Jesus. We're the best at living the Christian life. But Jesus sees right through us. Jesus can look through that facade with those piercing, fiery eyes and see what the true condition of our heart really is. Next are Jesus' feet, like bronze glowing in a furnace. And put simply, his feet represent strength and stability. He won't stumble. He won't fall. Jesus is solid and immovable, standing firm until the end. And how about Jesus' voice here? How about his voice, the sound of rushing waters? Have you ever been to Niagara Falls and stood close to the falls there? And you, you can't even hear yourself think that noise is so loud. It's almost deafening. So what's this say about Jesus' voice? And again, we go back to the Old Testament. Ezekiel 43.2. Ezekiel speaking of God. And he says this, And his voice was like the sound of many waters. That's the same description given of Jesus in Revelation. And by the way, later on, Ezekiel makes this comment which we're going to touch on in a minute. Ezekiel says, I fell on my face. He got in front of God and fell on his face. Keep that in your back of your mind for a minute. But as for Jesus' voice, it will be heard. Next, John tells us that Jesus holds seven stars in his right hand. Remember that song we used to sing when we were kids? He's got the whole world in his hands. And it's true. God does hold the whole world in his hands. He also holds the equivalent of many galaxies in his hands and holds the sun, the moon, and the stars in place. And I love what God says to Job. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Wouldn't that blow your mind to be in front of, of God, in front of Jesus? 
and you're trying to say something and he says, you're so smart, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? And later in Job, God says, can you bind the chains of Pleiades or loose the cords of Orion? Can you lead forth the constellation in its season and guide the bear with her satellites? Do you know the ordinances of the heavens or fix their rule over the earth? Oh, what great stuff. Here's God in charge and holding everything, the entire universe, into place. Next we read, a a double-edged sword comes out of Jesus' mouth. And again, going back to the Old Testament, Isaiah 49.2 tells us, He has made my mouth like a sharp sword. Hebrews 4.12, and I know a lot of you know this, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. The word of God is penetrating. And the sword represents Jesus' authority. And here Jesus possesses final authority. Someday soon, Jesus is going to return. And he's going to speak to the world with final authority. And finally, John says that Jesus' face was like the sun, shining in all of its brilliance. Ever ever gone to a movie in the afternoon, and you come out and walk outside, and it's like, whoa, you can't even see. You can't even see. Jesus' glory is blinding in its radiance. So how do you view Jesus? Do you see him as we did in the earlier portrait? Or do you see the Jesus of Revelation as he really is? I see him as king. I see him as creator of the universe. As the one who died for my sins and for your sins. The one who not only died, but walked out of that grave the one who is alive and will someday return to earth as total conqueror of sin. So take a look at the words in your outline. We have king, deity, dignity, strength, stability, big, authority, glory. And all of a sudden we look at that and we have a picture of Jesus who's not the gentle Jesus with children on his lap. This is the big, powerful, mighty Jesus the creator of the universe, and the one who's going to return someday and squash Satan like a bug. Revelation 1.7 says, Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. It doesn't say he will come, It says he is coming. This means his return is already in the process. This means the train has left the station. Circumstances are being moved into place for the end. And in God's mind, it's such a certainty that it can be said it's already started. I'm telling you, all you've got to do is look around you today in this world we live in. We may very well be witnessing events take place in our world right before our eyes that are going to bring us to the end. And when Jesus gets here, everyone is going to know it. There won't be a person alive who does not know it. And the scripture says, every eye will see him. Every knee will bow before him. Those who aren't Christians will no longer mock him. In terror, they're going to stand before a holy God. The God they ridiculed and laughed at. The God whose name they used in vain. And the God they ignored. The God they avoided. And the Bible says... Some will be so fearful they'll call for the mountains to fall on them in order to hide them from the consuming wrath 
of God's fire. They'll mourn because of him. What will happen when Christ returns? How will people respond? But I think an even more important question than that is whether or not he'll know you when he returns. Whether or not you know him. Look how Jesus responded in verse 17. Or John responded in verse 17. John says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Remember Ezekiel saying that? When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Do you think John was a little bit frightened? How do you think we'll feel when Jesus returns? When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Have you ever, ever been in a situation where you're really nervous to meet someone? And you're just so nervous you can hardly, it's hard to catch your breath and, and you're worried what to say and your hands begin sweating and your hands begin to sh- shake. John saw Jesus. He did more than have trouble breathing. His hands were more than shaking. He fell at his feet as though he were dead. That's the Apostle John. The Apostle John. Jesus' old friend, John. John, the one who Jesus loved. John, the one who reclined with Jesus at the Last Supper. John, who is Jesus' best friend? And he could only cower in the presence of Jesus. John was so frightened that he fell at Jesus' feet as though he were dead. I wonder how we'll respond when Jesus returns. I wonder how many of us are ready for that. Revelation tells us there's no place that Jesus is not watching because there's no place where Jesus is not. He's everywhere. He fills the cosmos with his holy presence. And John's warning to the churches is clear. Jesus is watching. Jesus is not the kindly grandfather who tussles our hair when we misbehave and says, well, Boys will be boys. Jesus is not the smiling buddy who winks and gives a little laugh at our sin and lets us do what we want. Jesus is a towering figure who's running out of patience with this world. He is God. He is creator. He holds the keys to death and Hades, as this says. He is Lord. He's in the midst of this church. He knows our sin. And believe me, he's big enough to do something about it. Jesus is more powerful than any problem you'll ever encounter. He's stronger than any foe you'll ever face. Jesus is victorious. Never underestimate Jesus. Never underestimate Jesus. I want to close with this. Every morning I get on my computer when I get to work, I look up the news. Got a couple of websites I go to that uh, actually tell more of the truth about the news than what you hear on television. And there's some days when I'm frightened by the events taking place in our world. We are actually viewing history as it takes place. You know, you look back to World War II and and things happened and a week or two later the world heard about it. With computers and technology today, something happens, we know about it almost instantly. With technology, we know what's taking place 
all over the world at any moment. And there are times when it's actually frightening what's happening around the world. And when the apocalypse and Armageddon does finally arrive, I find comfort in Revelation, what Revelation 1.17 says. And listen to it. Here's John, Jesus' best friend, on the ground in front of Jesus. He's so frightened. Face down. And it says, Jesus placed his right hand on me and said... Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys to death and Hades. I don't know what can be more reassuring to us than that. Jesus placing his hand on me, Jesus placing his hand on you, and saying, Do not be afraid, I am in charge forever. I don't know what you're going through in your life today or how you event worldwide events. I don't know what kind of problems you face, how frightened you are by life and its issues, or what kind of sin you're dealing with in your life. Some of you may have even had it with everything. You're just fed up to here, and you've had enough. But I do know that if you turn your life over to Jesus, if you've been baptized for your, the remission of your sins and received the gift of the Holy Spirit, God is with, is with you every moment of every day of your life. And his hand is on you and he's saying, don't be afraid. I'm here with you, and I'll always be here with you.